go straight to the fallacies. Um, if at the end we have time and nobody has to run right out the door, if you'd like me to go back and show you those slides, I'll be happy to talk about them. But I think I want to, to, to wrap up the last section here. Okay, so what about going back to a gold standard? What would the virtue be? Okay, in the minds of most proponents of the gold standard, it puts restraints on the Federal Reserve. It puts restraints on the central bank that it can't create as much money as rapidly um, as it can under a fiat system. But what exactly does that mean? Well, I think I can best illustrate that by going through these, these objections. And these fallacies are raised not just by bloggers and people online, but professional monetary economists, people like Paul Krugman and Brad DeLong, and even a lot of monetarists who are generally free market raise some of these objections. So here's the first one. How, how many of you have ever heard this before? There's not enough gold in the world to return to a gold standard. You guys ever? Because M2 is currently $14 trillion, and we only have 8,000 tons of gold. And if you multiply that by the current price per ounce, it's, it's, it would be completely incredible. There's no way we could, incredible meaning not credible. It would be incredible. OK, that is a fallacy, as is, by the way, this comment by a lot of pro-gold people who will say, oh, no, there is enough. All you have to do is reprice gold at, the one I hear is $50,000 an ounce. <laughs> um, and then we'll have that that will support the money supply. OK, so these are actually both wrong. OK, so let's just start with a little math. Officially, I know some people in the room are going to say, yeah, that's sure, that's, that's like I'm going to believe that. But let's go with the official number. Officially, the United States holds 8,133 metric tons of gold. That's 262 million troy ounces, and it's held primarily at Fort Knox with smaller amounts at West Point and at the Denver Mint. So the current M1 in the United States, and I just checked this uh, at the beginning of the month, is uh, $3.69 trillion. And if you want to go even further to M2, that's $14.28 trillion. So in order to fully support all of that money with this amount of gold, you would have to price gold at $14,000 an ounce to back all of M1. You'd have to price gold at $55,000 per ounce to back all of M2. Okay. Um, if we were to reprice gold at $50,000 an ounce, here's one of the problems we'd have. There would be a major global arbitrage event because gold is still going for $1,200 internationally, and yet it's fetching $55,000 in the United States. So gold would flood into the U.S. from all over the world, and whether we have a Fed, which hopefully we wouldn't under this system, but if we had a Fed or the commercial banks would be obligated to produce $55,000 in paper money for every ounce of gold received, and that money would flow back out overseas, those holders of that money would probably pretty quickly buy real goods and services from the U.S. So we would see... I mean, I did the math kind of just in the back of my head. It could even be a majority of the production of all U.S.-based goods and services would go overseas, and that would result in a major lowering in the standard of living for Americans. Not only that, with the huge flood of inflow of gold, we would probably have a major inflationary event in the United States. And I don't know, I could probably think of some other bad things that would happen, but just off the top of my head, it, it's extremely disruptive. We, you just can't do it. So this idea that whatever you price gold at, it has to back M1 or M2 by 100%, I, I note that as a fallacy. If you, if you want a full reserve system, then you have to do this. But in the entire history of the industrialized world, gold is never backed either aggregate by 100%. So what I'm not going to say I'm suggesting, what many pro-gold economists suggest is you don't have to replace the whole thing. Just take what are today's Federal Reserve reserves, which is currency plus the computer balances, just replace the reserves with the gold. That's how it was in the past. In the past, gold was a reserve. It wasn't a backing for every checkbook dollar and every banknote dollar and every money market dollar and every savings deposit dollar. So here's a visual. Okay. Here's the current system. The monetary base today is currency, Fed notes, plus a bunch of zeros and ones on a Fed computer, which are the balances for commercial banks. We're just saying whatever that balance is, you just change it out and put gold coins in its place. Okay, now if we do that, is there enough? Well, 262 million ounces is $315 billion. If you go on the Federal Reserve, the St. Louis Fed site, and you look, the current Federal Reserve system requires all of its commercial banks to hold $190 billion in reserves. And we have $315 billion in gold, so there's more than sufficient gold 
to replace the current required reserves with gold reserves. Okay. Um, currently, if you add all demand deposits and checkable, ch other checkable deposits, it comes out to $2.12 trillion. So $315 billion would represent roughly a 15% reserve ratio. And today, the legal reserve ratio is 10%. It's actually less than 10%. Because commercial banks are required to carry a reserve ratio of 0% for all balances up to $16 million and up to $122 million, they only have to back them 3%. That's why um, the required reserves are not one-tenth of this number. It's not $212 billion. It's only $190 billion. <laughs> now, there is a problem with the cash because there's $1.7 trillion of cash in circulation. So if you want to back that 10% by gold, you'd have to come up with another $169 billion. And if you do, I know this is getting a little math heavy, but if you, if you take care of your required reserves at today's price, you're left with $125 billion, which is just short of what's required to back the cash 10%. But I put here gold purchases. I mean, how hard would it be for the U.S. Treasury to quietly buy $45 billion in gold? That's like... Steve Mnuchin's bar tab, if I, okay? I mean, as much money that flows in, right? We have a federal budget of $4 trillion. It's not difficult to quite, I mean, we know the Chinese and the Russians are doing it, right? They're buying a lot more than that, so quietly. On. So if you buy $45 billion worth of gold, boom, you've got enough to back the cash. Or what if gold goes up to $1,300 an ounce? Now your problems, are, or $1,400 an ounce, your problems are solved. And in fact, that's been true in the previous decade. We all know gold got to what, $1,800 an ounce, $1,900 an ounce? And the required reserves in 2012, instead of 190 billion, were only 104 billion. So in the last decade, there have been huge windows, multi-year windows, where there is sufficient gold to go back on a gold standard. And yet all that time, Paul Krugman's been writing in the New York Times, there's not enough gold to go back on a gold standard. Okay, there is. Okay, um, if you guys are curious where I got these numbers from, pull down my uh, presentation. These are the links to the St. Louis Fed. Um, some of you know I'm anti-Fed, but they, they do a really good job of, of, uh, <laughs> of warehousing all of the stats. So M1, M2, uh, you know, traveler's checks, checkable deposits, demand, it's all out there on these links on the Federal Reserve website. Okay, here's another uh, objection. Uh, if you go on a gold standard, it's vulnerable to, to gold supply shock. So as new gold discoveries are found, it could create unexpected wild price inflation, a bunch of gold flowing into the system. Okay, well that's true. Gold was discovered in California, Australia, Yukon, South Africa. In, in the early 1900s, they discovered the cyanide process for refining gold. That, re that, that resulted in huge uh, gold uh, levels of gold production. But let's look back at the worst case historically ever. The, 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 the worst case of a gold boom was the California gold rush. From 1849 to 1857, the GDP deflator arose from 5.71 to 6.42. So that's 12.4% over eight years. That's a compounded inflation rate of 1.5%. I mean, if only we could have 1.5% inflation under the current Fed regime, and yet they're warning us we're gonna have runaway inflation if their new gold discoveries are, you know, are located somewhere on Earth. In the 16th century, in the New World, as the Spanish were enslaving uh, uh, native uh, um, Indians and, and mining gold, it was flooding into Europe. That was called the Price Revolution Century. Prices in Europe rose sixfold because of all of this new gold in 150 years. Compounded annually, that's 1.2 percent inflation. By contrast, in the Fed era, the last 104 years, prices have risen 25 fold in the last 104 years. That's actually not as bad as it sounds. 3.14 percent, so that's double, over double the rate. And during the stagflation era from 1971 to 1983, prices rose by 146% in 12 years. So that means your dollar was worth 38 cents after 12 years. Okay. So no, a gold standard is not going to create a supply shock. Okay, another objection, Barry Eichengreen. Not just Eichengreen, even Tyler Cowan subscribes to this objection. I know Rebecca's a Cowan fan, and so am I, but I, I think he's wrong on this one. Okay that if you use gold as a reserve, it'll, it'll create wild swings in your money supply because of gold price shocks. Look at how much the price of gold has skyrocketed in the last few years. So gold is very volatile and moves up and down very quickly. We can't possibly tie our money supply to that wagon, right? 
Well, they're reversing cause and effect. Gold prices are volatile precisely because we're not on a gold standard. Okay, under the current fiat regime, people are constantly moving in and out of gold as a hedge against inflation. If you go on a gold standard, people don't have the need to do that anymore. And in fact, if you look historically at the value of gold during the gold standard, uh, gold, uh, the, price of, the price of goods and services in gold terms was extremely stable during the classical gold standard era. Which brings up a larger point, which is uh, Larry White, who I've leaned on heavily for this presentation, he makes a point saying, look, we don't want to talk theoretical. Why don't we look at actual historical evidence and compare an actual gold-based system against an actual fiat-based system instead of what might happen theoretically in a gold standard? Another one, another objection. If we return to a gold standard, it'll create an epic windfall for countries like South Africa and Russia who will take over the world with their newfound wealth. Okay, that's a fallacy. You have to remember, gold mining is still a at-cost industrial enterprise with a thin profit margin. So if, in fact, this stimulated gold production in Russia or in South Africa, it's not like all this gold is free for them. Okay, it costs money. Gold production would simply become one more industry or service that that country performs, no different from mining copper in Chile or producing cars in Japan. Okay, it's just another business. A gold standard is harmful to the environment because you have to mine it and capital resources are expended to implement it. Now I'm a little sympathetic with this argument, okay, I don't want to dig huge holes in the ground all over the planet, but we already mine tin, copper, iron, coal, zinc, I mean every other metal you can think of and in much, much larger quantities than gold. So it's not like gold mining is suddenly, it's not like the earth is, has no holes dug in it whatsoever and then gold mining is suddenly going to uproot the entire surface of the planet. It's just one more small addition. And as far as pr using precious human resources to mine gold, well, what about the central banks themselves? We have 20,000 people working for the Fed, 13,000 for the Bank of France, the central bank of the Russian Federation, I don't understand this, employs 71,000 people. Uh, I counted the dozen major industrial countries employ 150,000. I'm guessing, I would have to think the whole world probably employs over a quarter million people just in the central banks alone. And then how many more have to, are employed by commercial banks in the media, at the universities, in government, with the regulators, in the financial markets, to write about the Fed, to research the Fed, to, to interface with the Fed, to speculate based on what the Fed's going to do next, right? I, I think the current system is a huge waste of, of human resources also. And what about capital resources? Well, it's true, you have to use the capital to mine gold, but what's the cost of capital resources over the years that have been wasted and squandered in these bubble and these these fiat regime induced bubbles where we overinvest in real estate in the 20s or in the recent uh, 2008 crisis or commercial real estate in the late 80s or in Japan in their bubble in the 80s or the dot com boom in the late 1990s 32 different countries with housing bubbles from 2001 to 2006 Personally, I think the waste of capital in global macroeconomic bubbles is much greater than whatever bulldozers or whatever are required in order to mine gold out of the ground. Um, also, it's so expensive to implement. Milton Friedman in 1960 did a study and he said, well, if we go back to a gold standard, the administration will cost 2.5% of GDP. That's huge. Right? And everyone, most of you in this room know Milton Friedman's great on freedom, but he was anti-gold. You guys know he called he called people like me gold bugs. Okay, he he thought we should have a free market and everything except money. Well, the problem is that's a full gold coin st standard. That is, it's like medieval times. That assumes that all commerce is going to be conducted literally with gold coins. So, uh, General Motors, right? They're going to walk around with huge bags of gold coins. And, 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 and th there's not going to be any checks, no bank notes, no electronic money, no credit cards, nothing. I mean, that, that's kind of ridiculous, right? So Larry White did his own study and said, well, if it was a fractional reserve gold standard using modern instruments, the cost would be 0.05% of GDP or about 1 50th of Friedman's estimate. Okay, now we, st we start dipping a little into, should I call this ab uh, absurd? I should call this neophyte. <laughs> I hear this not from economists, I hear it from people I argue with online. Gold is not suitable for money because it has no intrinsic value. You can't eat it and it doesn't do anything useful. Okay. So okay, it does do something valuable. There's medical, dental, computer applications, but 
if the standard is if it doesn't do much, it doesn't serve much intrinsic purpose, we don't want to use it, then what do they have to say about Federal Reserve notes, which are just pieces of paper, and zeros and ones on a computer at the Federal Reserve? I, I guess you could argue Fed notes might double as toilet paper because because <laughs> in Venezuela, right, the boulevards, boulevards are beginning to double as toilet paper there, okay? But there's no real intrinsic value to a Federal Reserve note or to a computer balance. And the whole idea that it has to be very useful is fallacious in and of itself. We don't want a monetary commodity that's extremely useful in the economic world. Can you imagine if oil was the mo commodity that we based our money supply on? With all of the industrial uses of oil, mm -hmm. how much people put in their gas tanks and in trucks, and the money supply would be so unstable because so much of our money would be going out tailpipes instead. So you want something that isn't extremely popular in the economy. Okay, for the sake of time, gold standard caused the Great Depression. I think I've covered this by now that it wasn't the gold standard. And Lawrence White has rightly said the interwar period is a case where central banks, not the gold standard, ran the show. And I love this quote from him too. He says, several authors are identify genuine historical problems they blame on the gold standard, but they should have blamed central banks for having contravened the gold standard. I don't think I could put it any more beautifully than that. Uh, here's one that Krugman and Keynes would argue. Um, the gold standard ties the government or the central bank's hands. Like that's a bad thing, right? <laughs> okay. And this is an article I got. I don't know. She's, this is actually in an IT website, so I'm not sure who Natalie Wolchover is, but she wrote, in 2008, if we had still been on the gold standard, the government would not have been permitted to take palliative measures. Okay. There is some truth in that, but my own comment is if we had if we had still been sorry that's a typo still been on the gold standard, the government would not have been permitted to create the 2008 financial crisis in the first place through aggressive stimulus, real negative interest rates. Not that the gold standard created the Great Depression in the first place. So there's a lot of talk about from anti-gold people that well look look at look at how effective it was in mitigating the crisis, but they don't want to acknowledge that it was the fiat regime that caused the crisis in the first place. And if you think that you're going to mitigate crises and recessions, well, just ask Christina Romer her opinion. And Christina Romer is no free market libertarian, okay? She was chair of Obama's Council of Economic Advisors, and she's a, she's a Keynesian. She herself in 99, in her own study, said recessions have not become noticeably shorter. The average length is actually one month longer in the post-World War II era than it was in the pre-World War I era. There is no obvious change in the distribution of the length of recessions between the pre-war and post-war era. So in other words, the Fed's not doing a very good job of shortening recessions anyway. Um, Wolchover also says the government would no longer have the option of creating money in order to fund a war. And my response is great. Yeah. Okay. Let the taxpayers fund it. If the public really believes in the war, they'll be willing to accept the direct taxation instead of this, inf this taxation by stealth. She also argues the gold standard makes it more difficult for governments to repay sovereign debt since lower zero inflation will necess necessitate fiscal discipline. Other than me saying great, my other response is really? <laughs> is, this, is this an argument? That means governments will actually have to practice fiscal discipline. To me, that's great. Uh, I have three left, and then and then we'll be done. I, I'm, this is serious. There are economists who, who who make this argument. They say a giant gold meteorite can land on the Earth, and and it would create a disruptive supply shock. Okay, so I, I think when you hear this, they're kind of getting to the end of the list when they're talking about meteorites. So all right, so after billions of years, I'm not an astronomer, but I think meteors have been hitting the Earth for billions of years, and I don't think we found one yet, right? That's made out of gold. However. Elon Musk may put us in a position where we can go out and mine, mine the asteroids and bring them back, but it won't be cheap. So it's the same as mine. It would be a for-profit enterprise. Exactly, yeah. Um, I also did a little math, and I'm not a physicist, but the, the, according to the World Gold Council, uh, the human race has mined 187,000 tons of gold approximately um, in history. So if we assume this, this asteroid or this meteor has to be equal in size, that would double the money supply. Okay, it probably needs to be bigger than that, but let's say it's equal in size. That's 2.5 Queen Mary twos. Um, and it, assuming it survived the, the burn up in the atmosphere, I, my math comes out to 9.5 megatons of energy expended because there was that meteor that 
that burned up over Russia a couple of years ago, the Chelyabinsk, and the scientists calculated it was 10,000 tons and it, it released 500 kilotons of kinetic energy. So if you just do the math, now I've read that you're not going to literally get a mushroom cloud of 9.5 megatons, but the energy and the heat expended, the thing would, the gold on the surface would vaporize, it would turn into dust, and it would be scattered over hundreds of square miles. Um, it's not like there's going to be this big chunk just sitting in the ground for people to just walk up to and, and take to the bank. And that big meteorite or meteor would cause a serious environmental issues that would dwarf I think that that is kind of what I'm saying is that there's going to be other big problems to worry about other than just the gold. And look, realistically speaking, the probabilities are just ridiculously low. I mean, if you say, okay, let's give it 100 million years, maybe one, maybe one of these will hit in 100 million years. In 100 million years, we don't know what the economy is going to be like or the monetary system or what the human race will look like. Or so I said, okay, you know what, let's reduce it down to something realistic. Let's say, what are the probabilities in the next thousand years? Well, that, of course, is even astronomically worse, the probabilities. So why don't we compare some other astronomically, uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, astronomically uh, un unlikely events that could happen. I personally think the odds are so low, we have probably a greater chance in the next thousand years of a hacker uh, breaking into the Federal Reserve's computers and multiplying the reserve balances, especially with AI, maybe, yeah. coming in the near future. Um, all of the Fed governors could simultaneously go insane at the same open market committee meeting. I know that sounds ridiculous, but I really think the probability is greater of that than the gold meteorite hitting the earth in the next thousand years. And I say it's already happened. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious. Yeah. And this isn't just a theoretical. Look, in the last hundred years, I've found 58 instances of nationwide hyperinflation that have occurred. So, so, so they're willing to accept in a century a hundred separate instances of hyperinflation, um, but not accept the risk that in a, a hundred million or a billion years that a, a meteorite can land on the Earth. And this is the last one here, and this, this is what I, th I thought I was going to respond to George's comment about Elon Musk with this until he mentioned the asteroid. The irony is that the monetary policymakers, they really believe that their f monetary policy can reflect and manage effectively what is a complex economy with billions of daily financial transactions a day. But if one meteorite lands on the earth, we can't, we can't accomplish one devaluation. We can't hoard the meteorite. The government can't go out and, and make it off limits and put it away. Or we can't transition to some other metal. We can't do that once every hundred million years. But we can manage billions of economic decisions a day. So I know I'm getting a little sarcastic, I'm sorry, but I just think the argument is is really is is absurd. Um, okay, another objection. Now, this is actually not a fallacy. The credibility of today's governments and central banks to adhere to any form of gold standard would be insufficient to withstand redemption runs or speculative shocks. And this is George Selgin's argument, and he's a free banker. He's he's pro gold. He's arguing that anyone who would hold dollars, pounds, and yen already know the track record of central banks in the past and that it's not exactly a guarantee that they're going to adhere to the gold standard for, a, for the long term or that they won't devalue. Okay. So this is why um, it's important, in my view, that if you go back to the gold standard, you have to get rid of the central bank as well. A private or decentralized system of commercial private banks like they had in Canada and Scotland, for those of you who were in my June talk, this is much more reliable because a private bank that tries to unilaterally renounce convertibility or devalue, what do you think happens to that bank? It gets taken to court, or it loses all of its customers and it goes out of business. Okay, but do those rules apply to a central bank? If a central bank goes off, we already know, right? History tells us if a central bank goes off a gold standard or devalues. It's lauded for quote enlightened economic policy, and instead, it usually gets more power as a result. So you really have to scrap the central bank if you're going to go back on a gold standard, which, which leads us to another, and this is a fallacy. Um, Many economists say, well, if you have a gold standard, it's a fixed exchange ratio. It can be vulnerable to speculative attacks, kind of like George Soros when he attacked the British pound. He made a billion dollars uh, attacking the British pound in 1997. Or when FDR uh, devalued in uh, 1934, it resulted in chaos in the U.S. Everyone was trying to pull their gold out before he banned uh, private ownership of gold. Okay, well, that's true, except only governments and central banks can devalue. 
If there's no one who can devalue, there will be no speculative attacks in the first place. So this is another argument to get central banks out of the picture. If it's just commercial banks, they have to abide, abide by the terms of their contracts. And these, by the way, these are both instances where, in the case of the Bank of England, the Bank of England devalued and George Soros made his fortune. And in the case of FDR, the Federal Reserve ended convertibility. So this is central bank malfeasance. This can't happen under a decentralized private system. Okay, and finally, the, fu the last objection, and this will wrap up my talk, um, this is probably the most credible objection of all of them. The United States cannot recreate the classical international gold standard by itself. If the U.S. were to move unilaterally, our own gold standard would be vulnerable to worldwide changes in gold prices due to the remaining overseas fiat monetary systems. So even though we're on a gold standard, all of the countries overseas are still trading gold freely on the open market, and their own citizens are moving in and out of gold on a regular basis, trying to hedge against their own inflation. So there is a conflict between our set price of gold in the U.S. and the fluctuating price of gold overseas. Um, to a lesser extent, we don't get the benefit of the fixed exchange rates, which means we, we, we continue to have what we have today, which is banks hedging on currency if they take deposits in one currency and loan in another. They don't want to lose money if the currency they loan in is suddenly uh, moves against them in the currency markets. But the real problem is that you can't just have one isolated country on a gold standard while all the other countries are still on fiat and the price of gold is moving up and down um, with volatility. But this is why the United States should take a leadership position. Okay, the United States dollar is cur currently represents 63% of all global reserve currency holdings. It's down a little from its heyday, but it's still very high. We also have a list of small countries that operate on a dollar standard. They actually, they're not pegged to the dollar, they use the U.S. dollar as their currency. And that includes Ecuador, and there's one other Central American, uh, or I thought there was. Panama. Is Panama in there? Panama. El Salvador, I'm sorry. Pa Panama's on a peg. Or at least it was when I pulled this information. At least the article I pulled this from it was on effect. Notice Zimbabwe has 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 uh, dollarized, right? That's that's a fallout from their hyperinflation. Yeah, they may not last forever, by the way. And look at all these countries that pegged to the dollar right now as well. Uh, Venezuela officially pegs to the dollar, although on the black market the bolivar is worth a whole lot less. And I put China here with three asterisks because. China officially is not pegged to the dollar, and for the longest time they did peg. They now claim they're not pegging to the dollar and that they don't intervene. Uh, I, I'm not so sure how true that is, but with the current trade and tariff war going on, the RMB is depreciating. It's moving back closer to the original exchange rate. So with all of this influence uh, that the United States have, in fact, so much influence, there's a study by uh, Reinhardt and uh, Ken Rogoff, and then this guy, um, Ilzetsky, I listened to a podcast with him while I was uh, cooking dinner one night. Um, if you count reserve currency, dollarization, and pegs to the dollar, uh, contrary to popular belief, the dollar is a greater share of international trade than at any time in history. A lot of people think the dollar is on the way down. It's not. It's actually, it may not be the high, highest share of global reserves it's ever been, but it's actually the highest share of international GDP that it's ever been. The United States should take the lead. I guess I'll wrap up the talk by saying good luck, right, uh, convincing our politicians and our central bankers and our mainstream ac academics to take that step forward. Okay. Okay, here are some reference material, um, but I'll go ahead and wrap the talk up. I'm sorry I ran well over 90 minutes. Okay. Uh, okay. But uh, I'll I'll stop it here. And you want, uh, okay. I'll, I'll take questions. How does this sound? Okay, so I'll take questions if anyone has questions. Um, okay, I figured at least somebody would ask me, should I buy gold? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, what about making the coins? I mean, um, they used when the coins circulated, they were 90% gold when they were used as money. And how would, what would the coins be like? I mean, the, for instance, the little tenth of an ounce coin that you can buy is bullion is about the size of your thumbnail. Yeah. And when gold circulated as money, the $2.50 gold coin was about the size of your thumbnail. Right. 
So we want to make the coin small enough that people don't spend very much money to get gold for their dollars. Okay. Yeah. That's a problem. You guys know who Henry Blodgett is? He was the analyst who made his name predicting Amazon would be $1,000 back in the late 90s. He's raised a similar criticism. He said, well, the coins would have to be gold dust, <laughs> right, in order to get the value, the, the denomination that small. Well, I mean, the, you could, wouldn't want to mint, mint a coin that you have to send $1,000 to get the coin to make it smaller than make yeah. $100, which I think you could do. Yeah. Well, you could think in terms of grams mm -hmm. instead of ounces, right? And it could have a small gold content in the middle, it could be a bimetallic coin and it would have a larger base metal around. Like you guys have ever seen the Canadian $2 loony, I think the, I think the loony is a bimetallic. The Euro's coins are definitely bimetallic. Of course, there's no real gold or silver in them. But if you ask me, I'm only going to speculate because I don't know if anyone knows for sure what it would look like. But I suspect gold coins would probably not circulate in the economy. I think they would tend to stay in the banks as reserves and that people would overwhelmingly use paper substitutes. They would use bank notes. They would use their checkbooks. And we have precedent. Um, I, I haven't confirmed this, but George Selgin says it, and he's so reputable, I tend to believe him. According to George Selgin, um, during the Scottish free banking era, um, the Scot many Scottish banks, some of the largest banks, could actually get away with reserve ratios of 2%. Okay? And that the bank notes were so trusted and the private system was so sound that when a Scotsman got his hands on a gold guinea, he couldn't wait to get to a private bank and trade it in <coughs> for a more convenient bank note. So if I had to speculate, I would say there would be very little circulation of coins for commerce. It would probably be people who are just a little bit anxious about the future who want to kind of stockpile a few gold coins in their safe or whatever. Or they want to impress somebody when they're buying that's true, or I don't know, make jewelry out of, you know, out of the coins. or might have a gold coin, I'm going to buy this, and it's going to make money, but I probably will yeah. circulate yeah. a little bit. Yeah, you, but, yeah, you could. I'm also give a question about the silver, because I was a little kid. Silver coins did circulate, and if you wanted to buy something for a quarter, you had to use a silver coin, because all the quarters made out of silver. But you didn't really have a quarter with the silver. The, there's another word, if you melted the coin down, you wouldn't get a quarter. You get far less than a quarter in that silver value. When? Oh, 1964 and before. I would think it would be the opposite. I, and I look, I've never had the, heard the question, but if you went back and looked at the market price of silver in 1964, I'm going to guess that the silver content even in 1964 was greater than 25 cents. I don't think it was. Okay, I could be wrong. It wasn't, it wasn't 100% silver. It was 90 percent silver, but yeah. the point is, is that I remember that it just is like they had silver certificates or redeemable in silver and get two silver half dollars. But you weren't really getting a dollar worth of silver. It was interesting. No, in, in those days, now I, I don't want to speak in at the specific year of 1964, but in the days when coins were issued and they weren't 100 percent, right? Mm -hmm. You and I talked about this because yeah, so, they can't be 100 percent. I learned this from you. They'd be too soft and, yeah. and malleable. Uh, the government would would redeem the, based on the content of the silver itself, knowing that 10 percent is a base metal. It would it would calculate that the 90% that is silver is worth however much or what have you. And I think that would be true for your 1964 question, that it's true. You melt this, the quarter down, only a certain percent of it is going to be silver, and the rest is going to be very, like, virtually worthless base metal. But, the, but on the silver markets, I don't know what the price of silver was in 1964. I would think it would be greater than 25 cents. And I know today a dime, if you have, I looked it up because I've got one. I wonder how much it's worth. I looked up the silver content in the current uh, pre-65 or 64 dimes, and I think it's a couple of dollars. Oh, now it is. Now, yeah. Yeah, I, I know. It's tr you're right. We're in a fiat era. I know we're exactly what you mean. We're in a fiat era, so the price has gone up. But I don't know exactly in 1964 what it was worth. I was curious about that. Just because um, when people had to make small purchases throughout U.S. history, they had to use silver coins because they went 25 cents. They had to have a coin that was... They yeah. Gold's too valuable. But by the way, Derek, I'm 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 already uh, promoting Derek to our our local currency and coinage expert because I've had some conversations. He knows way more about coinage than I do. But I believe, correct me if I'm wrong. I think even in the 1790s, uh, the mint also minted coins that were non-gold and non-silver for very small denominations. Copper. Yeah, cop copper coins. Copper one yeah. Coins, yeah. 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 So, Okay, there was a question in the back. I'll get to you in a second, George. So I, I saw your hand go up, sir. I don't know if you still have the question. Okay, so George. A couple of questions. Um, 
Um, maybe this is another fallacy, but uh, and it's kind of related to one you mentioned earlier. Uh, the national debt is currently something like $21 trillion. Um, I don't know, you include the uh, entitlements out there and all the money in commercial and... Um, yeah, it's two planet Earths. Yeah, it's yeah. a huge, huge number. <laughs> yeah, Kevin, I've heard. How, so to raise it and phrase like I would a fallacy, how could $350 billion possibly support something like that? In, in, I mean, 350 times. Uh, well, uh, yeah, if I'm interpreting your question correctly, I, I, I will say uh, I will say there's a mistake in the question. Okay. That those liabilities, those, those are government liabilities that are to be paid for the next 40, 50 60 years. Gold doesn't have to back the total value of all transactions for a half century. Uh, it certainly didn't back in the classical gold standard era either. Gold only has to back a certain component of the money supply. The money supply itself, M1, M2, those dollars turn over and over several times in a year. If you multiply it times 60 years, they're going to turn over hundreds of times. But the general question about how are we going to meet those liabilities, which has nothing to do with the gold standard, that's a very good question. And that's a great segue to invite you guys to my talk in early 2019 when I'm going to talk about the national debt and the liabilities and how, uh, shocker to the people in the room, it's actually not as bad a situation as it sounds, even though I dislike it as much as you do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can, can I give you one more, George, and we'll go to the back, and then if there are no more, we'll, we'll come back to you. So what's, the, what's your okay. second question? Uh, the, other, the other thing was, we, uh, it was brought up earlier, and you said you were going to possibly address it later about the Supreme Court. Uh, yes. Possibly stacking the Supreme Court. Yes. Um, so that, you know, the uh, confiscation of, uh, ordered confiscation of gold, you know, was uh, by uh, private citizens might have been challenged as um, yes. unconstitutional. And you wanted to yeah, I've got, I know the answer to that. I'm gonna, it's going to disappoint you, though. Um, the, the whole controversy about stacking the Supreme Court was later. Yeah. It wasn't much later. But that was mostly over the, um, the, national, the national Industrial Recovery Act. Which was I just wanted to, I wondered if maybe it would have taken a while for this to work its way up to the Supreme Court, and you might have also had that in mind. Or, you know, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I don't know. I, I, is, is there a legal history of people challenging? Yeah. Um, I bet I can. I bet I can tell you where to find it, though. Um, uh, there's an economist named Sebastian Edwards at UCLA, and he's just recently written a book. Uh, gosh, I forgot what it was called. It's something like America's bankruptcy is probably not exactly right, but it's not, the whole book is nothing but the story of the Roosevelt um, gold saga wow. and how he took us off. And I'd love to beat you to it, but it's on hold, like 10 people are requesting it at the <laughs> library, and I'm too cheap to buy it uh, myself. But that, I bet if there's a legal, but if there's a series of legal challenges that stacked up to his executive orders, I bet it would be in that book. Okay, we had a question in the back. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, have you found that in historically, do societies usually converge upon a single medium of exchange? Or are there good examples where a society will use multiple, like so would silver and gold and other commodities exist side by side? So if we were left to our own devices, would there actually be like five different things that would be accepted as money? Or usually just does it converge to one? Yeah, um, boy, I wish. I wish I could answer that question with certainty. We can only look at history, yeah. um, but then the future. Um, you, do you know who Lou Rockwell is of the Mises oh, yeah. Institute? Yeah. yeah, you actually sound a lot like him with that question. That's a compliment. Um, where Rockwell says, if we got rid of all of the uh, all of the legal tender laws and we got rid of the Fed, and it basically became a complete free market and free choice in money, he argues that no one could possibly predict with 100% accuracy what the result would be because the market itself is a process of continuous innovation and it's constantly inventing things that nobody could have possibly predicted. So when he asked me what would people do in the future, I don't know. Uh, I think if history's any guide, if people had the choice, let's say the Fed's still in business, like Ron Paul wants, uh, the Fed's still in business, but you can choose something else. So if you like Fed notes, losing 3% of their value every year, you can continue to use Fed notes. Or if you want gold-backed money or silver-backed money or cryptocurrencies or whatever, you can do whatever. I think, if I had to guess, I think history shows people would probably go back to the metals just because there's such a long history of them in the first place, particularly if there is enough gold to replace all of the required reserves. Um, I know that's what I would do, okay? 
But you never know. I mean, I, I know I have some personal friends who are just absolute cryptocurrency nuts, and they even use them today. Um, so th there might be a movement there. Um, in history, people have used, when given the choice, they've used gold or silver. With, in the case of small change, that that has been a headache in 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 some societies. They've accepted, uh, you know, more base monies like copper or bronze or whatever to solve the pro the quote unquote big problem of small change, as, as economists call it. But for the do overwhelming majority in terms of dollars of economic transactions, it's historically been dominated by gold and silver, including during those times when there were, or, were no central banks dictating to people what they could do. So that's, that's my best guess. I, I know it's not a certain answer. That's my best guess. Okay, yeah, question. What do you think is the feasibility of a decentralized uh, gold-based uh, digital currency like cryptocurrency but backed by gold? Uh, I'm not enough of a technical expert, but uh, it sounds very interesting because, uh, and I don't think you were here in June when I gave my talk on Canada and Scotland, but Canada and Scotland uh, were completely decentralized banking systems with no central banks um, and it very lightly regulated that were based on gold um, and they issued whatever primitive form of gold substitutes existed back then and they were extremely stable, they're extremely viable, they're used as a model now for us to go back to, although the powers that be are probably never going to agree to that. If you're suggesting that it becomes a digital medium instead of a paper or a yeah. checkbook balance medium, and again, let the market decide, but it might take some time to perfect it, but I, I could see that working. I mean, the ingenuity, right, of entrepreneurs might be able to figure it out, sure. But would, wouldn't that, wouldn't the point of that be so that it couldn't be inflated and it wouldn't be a fractional reserve type of Ah, yeah, good question. So what's to stop some firms from creating fully backed gold digital currencies and other firms from offering fractionally backed gold currencies? If it's a free market, anybody can do what they want. It would be a huge experiment. The public would choose what they feel, what they're more comfortable with or what they like better. And Chad and I had to talk about this over dinner. Um, uh, Chad, I hope I'm not misrepresenting your position. Chad t tends to be a little more on the full reserve side, and I tend to be on the fractional reserve side. And since there's never been a law against full reserve banking in the United States, and yet we don't see any today, uh, and especially if the system is fractional reserve digital system is as stable as the Canadian and the Scottish systems were, I would think, it's a guess, that the public would eventually choose the fractional system because it pays interest um, and because the public has not has voted not to patronize full reserve banks in the United States, or for that matter in Europe, for the last 200 or 300 years. That's kind of, that's kind of a four-letter word, fractional reserve banking with, with this crowd. But uh, anyway, you guys, you guys already know how I feel about that. So I hope I answered your question without rambling too far off topic. You sure? You want to ask it another way? Well, I've seen, I've seen some uh, company is trying to start this already, like goldmoney.com. Yeah. So it's sort of like you have a you have kind of like a debit card and you have say you put five thousand dollars of US dollars into the account. Now in a bank in Australia or something, they put five thousand dollars of gold on your little shelf. Yeah. And you can make buy Starbucks and they take, you know, two dollars uh, and move it to Starbucks. But Starbucks has to have an account as well? No, because they'll convert it to the fiat currency of choice, like instantaneously. So where do your claims on two and a half dollars worth of gold go? Uh, so they'll basically convert it to currency and then pay that vendor. But if you ever want to redeem your gold, they'll ship you your gold. So they're selling the gold on the open market in exchange for currency, and the currency is transferred yeah. to, it, in theory, I know they don't do it at that moment. They probably have a stock of, of fiat reserves that they use for those transactions. Yeah. But. Um, I'd have to think about it. it. I'd have to think about how that would work. That's a good question. Um, hmm. I I don't have enough time. I need to think that one through. I guess you'll just have to come back into another meeting, and I can tell you what I, what I what I think about that. One of the interesting things I thought was you put five thousand dollars in, but the five thousand you're putting in is probably from your checkbook, 
and now you're creating a new instrument on top of M1, even though it's backed by gold, but I'm ha I'd have to think through whether these, this form of currency is actually going to be an M2 component now, because probably not, but it, I'll quit thinking out loud. I'm, 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 I'll move on, but I promise you I will think about it. Okay. okay. It's, ten, it's almost 10 o'clock. Maybe one more, and then we'll, we'll call it quits. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, in that case, uh, thank you, thank you.